thank you. You can hear me? All right, that's better. Thank you for having me. This is exciting. Let me get this all hooked up here and see if it works. OK, cool. So I'm excited to be here. And today I'm going to talk about building community. And I will go through a little bit of uh, what that means to me, what, how we built our community, and um, how community has changed over the years. And um, first, I will give you a background on my business to set up the context for the presentation so you understand what it is I'm really talking about. And then after the presentation, if there's time, I will open it up for Q&A. Okay. Cool, all right. So as I said, um, as Ryan said, my company started with babysteals.com in April of 2008. And the passion inception, and inception behind the company started because I was a new mom um, of, to a baby girl, and I had had two boys, but it had been six years since I had had a baby. And I was a, a full-time career woman. I was the director of KSL.com at the time. And so again, six years go by since I've had a baby. Things change so dramatically. Um, how many people in here have kids? Just out of curiosity. Wow, OK, not many. Are we not in Utah? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I was 19, so there's that. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, so new baby girl. And I was looking online for the latest and greatest place to find all the cute things. And of course, as he mentioned, being the dot-com princess, uh, as my friends at KSL termed me, I always knew where the best place online was to get the best deal. But what I, what I discovered when I started really shopping for my baby girl online, because I um, you know, was so busy having two other boys and a full-time career. Uh, and online shopping actually at the time was relatively new, believe it or not, 2005, 2006. It wasn't um, all that popular in Utah. And I had lived in Silicon Valley for four years when I put my husband through chiropractic school. So um, things are about four years ahead out there. At least they were at the time. I think we've caught up quite a bit. But um, so I'm looking online for the best, cutest stuff for my daughter. And e-commerce was just so infantile. It was a picture and a price. And it really didn't um, explain why this and not that, and um, why this brand and not that brand, why this fabric and not that. And I was, that's what I was really looking for um, at the time. And I also wanted a great deal. And I just assumed there was somebody that would spoon feed a mom like me um, what was hip and what was trendy every day, because I didn't have the time to research it. And when I discovered that there really wasn't anything like that, I just decided to create it. And so that was the, that was the concept behind, um, or the idea behind the business itself. Um, I also wanted to connect with other moms like me. I felt, um, you know, I had always wanted to be able to stay home with a baby, and I w didn't have that luxury because, you know, as I mentioned, having a baby, actually I was 20, but barely. Um, my husband and I, you know, spent our early days of parenthood really just focusing on getting him through school and getting his career going um, in, in school, and so it was, um, you know, I, I was always working to get us through that effort. So I really wanted to stay home with this baby. And so that was another, that was the motivation behind my, um, my uh, idea to have my own business. And the motivation was, man, I really want to be able to stay home with a baby and, um, you know, be able to do something from home. I believe that's everybody's dream, so it's nothing unusual. But um, it really started when I, I, I went on maternity leave at KSL, actually, um, with my daughter. And for the, those three months were really tough because it was all about the day that I had to go back versus enjoying the time. And when I pulled out of the driveway to go back to work um, on my, you know, on my first day back, uh, I was, I was just, I was crying. You know, as many, many moms do, it's a really unnatural thing to just up and leave your baby. Some people love it, and I just never did. I still don't. Um, so at that moment, I thought, okay, you know. I can do something to create my own destiny and um, really do something for myself. So that was really the, um, the motivation behind wanting to find some kind of an idea. And then it just kind of happened after really opening my eyes to what is it that I want. And so babystills.com was really started out of a need for me. It wasn't started because Rhett and I wanted to um, you know, start some idea and create a company and sell out in three years. It was really based on a need. I didn't even know what um, a sellout or an exit strategy really meant at the time. And we get asked that question a lot now, seven years in. 
but um, it was started out of a need. And so um, babysteals.com was the first deal of the day site for women. This is what our site looks like now. And what we do is we highlight one brand at a time every 12 hours. So at 9 a.m. and 9 p.m. every day, we have a new high quality product that our team has hand selected um, up at a steal at the best price online until it sells out or for that full 12 hours. And then every day um, at 9 and 9, like I said, we have something new. And we've done that now consistently for almost seven years this April. Let's see. So babysteals.com is niche, very, very niche, and it caters um, to anything from maternity up to three years old. And um, we, we started this in our garages. Rhett and I, I partnered with him. He, we were associates. Um, he was um, in management at backcountry.com, which I'm sure most of you have heard of. And I was at KSL, and we, we met through that partnership and we're to, through a partnership with our two companies. And um, I was able to run my idea by him a few months after launching the business. And we ended up business partners. And that's, that's a long and cool story, but um, that's how we ended up partners. So it took me about 18 months to start the business. From the time I had the idea and I thought, there really isn't a website that spoon feeds moms what's hip and cool, and it gives it to them a great deal. There really isn't. I need something like that for me, and, and, um, and I want to connect with other moms that are like me. As I mentioned earlier, I wanted to know that I wasn't the only working mom in the world that was busy and uh, missed her kids, and I really wanted to connect and, and meet other moms online. So it, it seemed like a really daunting idea. How in the world do I start a business when I'm director of radio, um, you know, internet sales at KSL? and you know, three, three kids, but I just did one thing a day. One thing a day before I went to bed, if I hadn't got to it, I did not allow myself to go to bed until I took one step forward, no matter how simple that step was. And that just kept the motivation, it kept the drive, it kept the passion, and it kept me going to make you know, my obsession my profession. So Rhett and I started this company out of our garages. We didn't pay ourselves for the first year. It started off of $5,000 of my savings. And as you can see, this is kidsteals.com. And this is scrapbooksteals.com. And this is shesteals.com, our newest website that caters um, to, um, solely toward women. So there are four websites that are daily deal websites in the steals.com family. And this is how one of our customers, Caroline Brockner from New York City, um, this is her self. Um, this was actually, you can probably tell by the format, it's a post she did on our Facebook page. Baby Steals and Kid Steals and all the Steel Network sites have paved the way for a new kind of shopping experience for parents. Not only does Steel Network provide a chance for us to try high quality products at a fraction of their retail value, it also provides a platform for interacting with the company employees, even the owner and CEO, as well as other Steel Network shoppers. And in the past three years, I've been able to steal hundreds of amazing products but I've also met hundreds of wonderful women as a result of the company. It really is a steel network. So fast forward to almost seven years later, we'll be seven in April. We've shipped over two million orders all around North America, including Canada. We've generated over $66 million in revenue over the years. And we are still bootstrapped, meaning um, Rhett and I are the sole owners, and we don't have any investors, loans, or debt. So given this presentation is about, about community is why I wanted to tell you what Caroline said, and this is just a small snippet of you know, thousands and thousands of comments that we're fortunate enough to have had over the years. So what is community? It's defined traditionally as a group of people living in the same place or having a particular characteristic in common. But a more modern way to define community is number two, a feeling of fellowship with others as a result of sharing common attitudes, interests, and goals. Emphasis on feeling and sharing and realize there's no physical proximity required, and there'll be more on that later. But translation is this, community is a chance to talk about the same thing at the same time with a, very, a group of people with the same interests. And this is part of what it means to belong and to have a central focus, and quite often, as it is with our website, an actual appointment 
and that's where 9 a.m. and 9 p.m. comes in because people know exactly when they're supposed to come every day. So speaking of community, I would be remiss if I did not bring up who I consider my marketing inspiration. I stumbled on Seth Godin about a year after starting the business, and I have been a loyal member of his community, or tribe as he he's calls them, uh, ever since. And I consider Seth the godfather of marketing, and I will quote him several times in this presentation, and many of the concepts are some of his teachings. And I highly suggest, if you're into marketing at all, subscribing to his daily blog. It's very small, quick emails, but um, they're really relevant and very, very cool. So our culture is fragmenting in a very big way, and mass observances other than holidays are really hard to find. So a chance for us, as I mentioned a minute ago with community, a chance for all of us to talk about the same thing at the same time is very interesting. And the Super Bowl is a very large scale example of this happening. And this photo needs no caption, but it created huge amounts of conversation, both online and offline. And these occurrences happen often um, in much smaller communities as well. So like right now, um, CES, the Con Consumer Electronics Show in Vegas, there's a lot of buzz about what's happening down there and lots of talk around that. Um, the Outdoor Retailer Expo that's coming up in a couple weeks here in Salt Lake City, lots of talk about that as well as Sundance. Those are all niche examples of the, the desire for people to be in sync with one another and to talk about the same thing. But your customers and your employees want to feel what it feels like, what it, or they want to feel what it feels to do what other people are doing. And not everyone necessarily, but just the people that they identify with. And so community is essentially leading and connecting people and ideas. And people have wanted this and they have done it forever. And people are very used to having a spiritual community. And they're used to having a neighborhood community. For those of you that may not recognize this picture, it's from the Desperate Housewives show. But just a good example of a neighborhood community. And they're used to having an office community. I hope you guys recognize this one. <laughs> My favorite show. How many of you are Bob Marley fans? OK, just a few. Me. Well, OK, so the idea or product or movement that you create is not about everyone. It's about the true believers in what you do. And Bob Marley did not invent Rastafari. He just stepped up and he made people want to follow him and become Rastafarians. And Martha Stewart did not invent all things domestic, but she stepped up and she set the bar for domestic perfection and made people want to follow her, or not. In my case, I totally do, I love her. <laughs> and it only took 350 original people in the Grateful Dead fan club to turn into hundreds of thousands of deadheads around the world. So community used to be limited by geography. And this is one way that community has changed over time. Community um, used to be limited by our television and our radio signals, and our local newspaper could only go so far. And so local was really the category, and people's interests were typically aligned locally as well. Everyone watched the same television shows, the Cosby Show back in the day was the one everybody watched, Cosby Show and Cheers. Um, and people watched the same commercials, they shopped at the exact same stores locally, and they knew a lot of the same people. But the internet has changed the way community is created. Because today, of course, the signal travels around the world. And so newspapers, radio stations, and TV signals have no reason to limit themselves, and commerce too. And people, at the end of the day, are a lot more interested in what they're interested in than opposed to what their physical neighbors are doing. And you don't need to advertise in the media anymore to lead a community. And now more than ever, because of that, it's very possible to create your own community, whatever it may be, and lead it. And you don't have to have power or money like you used to to create a product or, or advertise something amazing or, or create a community. 
because the internet has changed that. It's leveled the playing field. You don't need to get your big break to be invited on Oprah Winfrey or Martha Stewart to become somebody or to have an amazing company. So all the tools are there and the internet basically gives anyone who wants to pick themselves as a leader to, they, the internet lets you pick yourself to be a leader and gives you a chance. And again, you don't need to get a big break. And when you create a community, you are prov you're providing content, you're gathering people, and you're providing value, and more on that later. But the people that do this are the narrators and the curators of interest for groups that have aligned interests. Like the cloth diapering moms, this happened in April of last year and it'll happen again this April. These moms coordinated breaking the Guinness Book of World Records for the number of cloth diapers changed at one time. And throughout the world, in 182 locations and in 15 countries, there was 8,301 cloth diapers that were simultaneously changed around the world, no matter what, all at the exact same time. And of course, that's, you know, connecting these people over the internet is what um, allowed this to happen. Or an online forum of Star Wars fanatics that connected people that eventually got married. <laughs> <laughs> But now communities are connected online with similar interests and ideas are everywhere. From triathletes to bodybuilders, to Disney lovers, and there are even communities within these communities such as the Wonderlanders of Disneyland. <laughs> Gonna crack up about that picture, it's so cute. <laughs> or our favorite sports team. But as a leader, you don't need everyone to follow you. You just need those with similar interests. And communities are now created based on like-mindedness, not your physical proximity. So leaders that created communities, how are they creating these communities? Well, Seth Godin says, they build a culture, they challenge the status quo, and they commit to their community, their cause, and their passion. And obviously these two leaders created extremely large communities at the very same time with very different ways to challenge the status quo. And many leaders create much smaller but just as impactful of communities. An example of that would be Rachel Coleman from Signing Time. Does anybody recognize this pretty lady in the orange room. Wow, more people than know about Bob Marley? <laughs> well, I'm gonna tell her that because she happens to be my best friend. So uh, I will tell her that. But if you don't recognize this lady in the orange sweater, you will the next time you turn on PBS or Netflix or Nick Jr. possibly. But this is my best friend, coincidentally. Her name is Rachel De Azevedo Coleman and she's been challenging the status quo for the last 13 years, um, teaching people sign language and they're teaching people that it isn't just for kids that are deaf. She, was or she had a daughter, her first daughter was born, um, uh, and after a year they discovered that she was deaf. And a few years later she had another little girl who was actually born with spina bifida and cerebral palsy. And obviously little Lucy, who is now 14, had no way to communicate with anyone because she could barely move her arms. Um, at the time. And what Rachel discovered two years after having Lucy and having Lucy watch their family um, do American Sign Language to, for Leah, um, she started to notice that little Lucy was starting to move her arms very much um, like little um, ASL signs, like this is the sign for more. And she could tell that Lucy at certain parts when she was more hungry or certain times when she was hungry would try to sign more. And that's when she realized Sign language is not just for people that are deaf, it's for anyone. It's for communicating with anyone. Babies, children with special needs, it's not just for people who are deaf. And so she created a video um, in her home with her husband and her sister and other people in her family to pass out the video to other people in their family so that they could learn sign language to sign with Lucy and Leah. And now she no doubt hasn't uh, or has taught sign language to millions 
of people worldwide. She has 30, 38 um, DVDs. Actually, I'm probably wrong, because I think she just released, Signing Time Christmas was just released. I think that's 39. Anyway, but Rachel is now the rock star to little babies everywhere. We don't go many places that they don't, if, if they watch Signing Time, they, they, um, they point out Miss Rachel. And um, she has created a community single-handedly. And people that needed to, she made a difference. And she changed people's lives. And just simply by leading and teaching people to communicate in a different way, people that needed connection, and she committed to the cause, and she still does to this day, every single day. She committed to the passion, and she committed to the community. And now, we can safely say that hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, have signed with her daughter, Leah. How many gamers in the room? Not many, all right. Well, maybe I'll skip the slide, but um, uh, if you haven't heard of MLG, it's basically um, Major League Gaming. And this is also a friend of mine, Sundance Di Giovanni created Major League Gaming in 2002. And this was a way to connect the people who were playing League of Legends, Call of Duty, and other games, StarCraft, together um, just with their friends. But he created a way to connect the world by playing video games and ranking and filing, and not just from um, not just by being able to play against people that you hadn't met yet, but to, um, to compete against each other and to also connect with each other to watch um, some of the best players in the world play. And they don't, he doesn't just do this um, now just over um, MLG TV. It's, um, it's actually been on ESPN, I believe, as well as they have um, huge events twice a year called MLG. And um, they go out and um, connect in huge ways. And, at this point, um, you can safely say that millions of gamers worldwide know about MLG and have been connected. And it's, that's a very, very, very difficult um, demographic to reach as well if you're an advertiser. So MLG is a very, very highly valued, or valued business financially. And it's because of the connection that was created with this very, very hard to reach demographic. So like Rachel and Sundance, I built my community through necessity and through passion. And I didn't need, let's see here, look at my notes going. I, ha I had a need, and come to find out, a lot of other moms had that need too. Please, somebody else do the work, spoon feed me the latest amazing product for babies and kids, but give it to me at a great deal and let me meet other moms just like me. And we've connected people from Florida to Montreal and from Los Angeles to Saskatchewan, all over um, North America. And I, although I combine my obsession with my profession, I am so personally connected to my community to this degree. And many of them are um, some of my best friends and personal confidants to this day. Um, this picture is one of our customers in Vancouver. I don't even like to call her a customer because she's such a good friend now. But um, there's a lot of cool stories on the way we met, but it was basically through babysteals.com at the time. And I was doing all the customer service myself, as uh, Rhett and I did every job in the business for the first year as we grew and grew. Um, now we have about 55 employees in Salt Lake City. But um, in, in doing all of that myself, I was able to connect with so many amazing people and become you know, really true friends with a lot of our customers. And we do a lot of crazy things. And, and a quick story that um, epitomizes this picture is um, we became very quick friends online, but I never anticipated that I would fly to Vancouver to meet a customer. And I used to do, and still do, um, some live broadcasts or live chats, if you will, with customers and, and talk and answer their questions. Sometimes I show them products. And, um, and sometimes we just talk. But um, there, these little baby steals meetups were happening all around, it's mostly Canada, but there were several in some of the key cities um, in the States, LA and um, Seattle, Salt Lake City and Dallas. And I got a call from Dunya, her name, and um, asked if I would Skype over um, a meetup that they were going to do, if I would just Skype for five minutes and say hello to all the people that went to her house that were Baby Stills fans. And um, we like to do kind of crazy, wild things. 
So we showed up. <laughs> and that was really amazing. So this is um, one of the evenings we went out to dinner and we had a blast. And I was able to go to her house. And she was aware, by the way, I didn't actually trick her. Uh, but we did trick everybody else, and that was really funny. And the other cool thing that we did, long story short, was we actually um, hand-delivered orders throughout um, British Columbia and Alberta between Calgary, Edmonton, and uh, Vancouver to our top customers' homes. And, and I drove all around um, and literally knocked on people's doors and handed them their order. And uh, it seems really weird, but it was an unbelievable way to meet our customers in person, and people were really, really, really surprised to see us. And it was a blast. As a matter of fact, it started to really escalate over the five-day tour to the point that on the last day, we needed to know if they were home because it was usually 45 minutes from house to house. So our customer service director would call in the morning and say, you know, I'm so sorry, I'm calling from Baby Stills. We accidentally Federal expressed your order, which means you need to sign for it. Are you going to be home today? Well, that worked for the first three days. And then on the last day, it did not work. And people started to scream if they got a, a phone call from the 801 number. <laughs> and it seemed really strange for us, because it's like, well, you didn't really win anything. You bought this, actually. <laughs> but we are coming to say hi. But it was unreal how excited people were. Um, and you know, there's a lot other really, really cool stories that go along with that trip. But the long and short of it was we really were able to see firsthand the connection that um, our company had made with these individuals on a personal level, as well as um, how many of them had connected with one another, which, which means the world to us. We called that operation We Send Joy, because that We Send Joy is one of the mission statements for our business. And we also do meetups. Um, we flew to Eastern Canada a year ago and met a lot of customers face-to-face -face in uh, Montreal and uh, Toronto and in New York City. And fans, believe it or not, even come to visit us from all over. We've had fans come from Singapore, uh, from New York, from Dallas, uh, I think, yeah, from Russia. It's kind of amazing. But when they come to visit us, we make it a really big deal. And we give their baby or child a little photo shoot, because our photo studio is there. And it's a lot of fun. This is a particular girl that became a really good friend of mine. She's um, in Idaho. But she was a great customer of ours. And um, long, long story short, she lost a baby um, at Primary Children's. And two of um, me and one of my other staffers were able to go visit her while she was there. Um, and we were able to rally a bunch of our customers together to buy a really sweet headstone for her baby. It's hard to get through without crying. Um, but it created this little phenomenon of these women who really wanted to, to connect with each other, and so much th so that a comic started creating cartoons about our company and posting it on our Facebook page because his wife was a fan, and he saw the crazy fanaticism that people had about not missing the steal and getting there on time and talking to other moms. And we have um, a local pickup where if you're from Utah, you can select a free warehouse pickup and just stop by Monday through Friday and pick up your order. And we didn't realize that people would start combining in neighborhoods in Idaho Falls and in Casper, Wyoming, and in Denver, Colorado, and driving once a week together to pick up their orders because nobody wants to pay shipping. <laughs> so, so he wrote a comic about that. Nancy and her friends took a local pickup at Baby Stills very seriously. <laughs> and, he created a series of 12, and this is actually him in the middle. He actually came from Oregon to visit us, and we surprised him by making a canvas out of um, most of the artwork he had created at that point and putting it on our wall. So when he came to visit us, his comics were on the wall. Scrapbooksteals.com retreats are another thing we do. Of course, women who love to scrapbook love to scrapbook together. So we uh, just finished our most recent <laughs> scrapbook retreat. And um, we had women fly from all over. And as you can see, we had a huge crowd of people in front of scrapbooksteals.com. And so much so that, <clears throat> as a matter of fact, scrapbooksteals.com's Facebook page has what I believe is the largest collection of user-created scrapbook pages on Facebook, period. And, um, and scrapbookers from around the world have not only connected with us by coming to visit personally, but as well as becoming friends with each other and longtime confidants. And not only do they consistently inspire each other with their art, 
but um, they've become such personal friends that it's quite often that one will surprise another in a city and they'll travel to meet each other, having nothing to do with our company at all. We just facilitated the connection. So permission vis versus interruption. This is a Seth Godin, um, I'm not sure if it's a book or if it's like one of his small write-ups, but um, I believe it's a book that he wrote on this and it's, I highly, highly recommend it. And he talks about marketing and how there's a huge difference between having permission to market to somebody or being interrupted. And when you think about it, when you're at the, when you're at the airport, if it's, if it's two o'clock in the afternoon, you're late for your flight, you're running to your flight, somebody stops you and says, hey, do you know how do I get to gate C6? And you're just like, dude, I gotta get to my own flight, you know, and you're not even gonna give them the time of day if you even have time. But if it's 5.30 in the morning, you're not in a hurry, the airport's relatively empty, not a whole lot of stuff coming into your brain, and someone stops and asks you, you're gonna take the time to turn around and help them figure it out. And marketing is no different. We are surrounded with hundreds of, or I, I believe it's now the average, and who really knows, but I think the latest stat I read was 40,000 marketing messages a day. And so having the permission to market to someone is an invaluable concept in business. And it's really the privilege of talking to people who want to hear from you and delivering very anticipated and personal messages to those that want to get them. And I believe that that's one of the reasons why my company has succeeded is because we have acquired all of our customers organically. Meaning, if somebody has heard about our business, it's not because they clicked on an ad online that we paid a pay-per-click ad for. Our business probably wouldn't exist if we had been doing that this whole time. It's because we created value and we meant something to people and um, we created our promises and we kept them and it created a level of trust and a brand that people wanted to rally behind. And so when they sign up for our email list or they come to our site every day by appointment at nine, they do that on their own. They're not doing it because we asked them to or because they saw an ad on television or heard it on the radio or were interrupted in their traditional going about their day. So how did steals.com grow our communi community? As I said, with permission, and that's why I brought that up and explained that a little bit because um, we didn't interrupt people with marketing to grow our community. They came on their own. And we built trust. And building trust is simply doing what you say you're going to do. If you say you're going to ship it in this period of time, ship it in that period of time. If you say it's gonna take weeks, six weeks, ship it in six weeks. But whatever, you're, whatever it is that you said, is that's really your, your brand, it's your promise. Your brand is simply a promise of what you said you're going to do. And we have built, built trust by really fulfilling those promises and doing what we say we're going to do. And it's, it's very simple, we just do good business. And then lastly, we treat customers the way that we want to be treated. Our customer service department is paid to do one thing, and that's simply to care. There are no scripts and no guidelines and no rules on what we tell them they can and can't do. They simply take each customer that may or may not have an issue as an individual, and they read the issue. And in fact, what they are tasked to do is, by the end of it, make a connection. Make sure they know that they can contact us again with, it, with any questions make sure to invite them back to our website, to our community, to maybe a giveaway on our blog or to read one of our newest posts. Whatever it is, invite them to come back and make them feel like home and, um, and really reiterate that trust and hopefully become friends with them. And also, we're very authentic. These are actually employees of ours and um, this was a promotion we put together just on who we are and how we're very different, but how we want you know, moms to really support each other online, but even if you are very different, that you can still connect. But we truly were started by a mom and we're serving moms, and so our community is also our employees. We're a team, we're 77% women, we've had 35 maternity leaves, and 
when we hire, we just simply look for authenticity. Now, granted, there's a lot of dudes at steals.com, don't get me wrong, but, um, but you know, we're, we're, we're very, very authentic. And, um, and we've hired our customers for uh, many of our customer-facing roles. And many of them that you see in this picture, I handpicked right out of our community that were, were customers and fans that never even thought that they could have a full-time job. And now they do, and some of them have worked for us for many, many, many years. We also take our own photography. Oh, that's not the right slide, sorry. That's not our photography. <laughs> this is our photography, but um, most often our models are our own kids or our fans' kids. Fans love to bring their kids by to our photography studio to get a little photo shoot with an upcoming steal of the day. And um, we use um, a lot of just local customers as, as female models on shestills.com. So we really try to be very realistic and, and very authentic. And we're also the ones that create most of the projects on scrapbooksteals.com, although we very often highlight our community. So we facilitated, we facilitated the, question, or the connection in many, many ways. We, first of all, in, back in the day when Facebook really was uh, a little different of a platform, we turned Facebook into the hub for customer connection and communication. And it really, um, babysteals.com at the time had one of the biggest, uh, most active fan pages online to the point that it didn't go more than about 16 seconds without a new comment. And we allowed people to connect there and comment on the steal and whatever it was they thought, and we just got out of the way. And these are just a collection of a few of the most recent posted pictures. So the number one question I get from people is, how did you guys grow if you don't pay for marketing? And I think I've given you a few of those keys. But um, again, every single day, new and entertaining content is created that focuses on a different niche, whether it's scrapbooking or your kid or your baby or yourself. And we're creating niche media by gathering people passionate about certain things and having them come back for more every single day. They have an appointment, they feel like they belong, and they know they are not the only one there. And they know exactly when to come back. And the community we target is built into our websites by design. And we grew. Let's see. Yes. Okay, so Word of mom is one of the things that I say. We know, and this is one of the reasons we treat our customers so, so well. We know when someone's at our website that they got there because someone else told them to go. It was a personal referral. It's a mom, a sister, a best friend, a neighbor, a coworker. And that means the world to us that somebody would extend a hand of referral and, um, and tell them to shop with us. And so that's one of the reasons why we take our community and our customers so seriously and take such good care of them. But that's also why they feel compelled to then tell someone else and then tell someone else. And also the very unique products. We don't sell things that you can easily go to Walmart and purchase. We typically sell things that um, are on the boutique side. And again, we do very grassroots and organic means of marketing, such as trips to meet our customers and um, retreats to bridge the gap between online and offline. And the unique products as well really market our site. A lot of people will look at a lot of the products that um, our customers will have or be using and say, where'd you get that? And there's this certain psychological thing that when a woman gets a good deal or anyone gets a good deal on some, something, it has this extra association of um, an extra buzz is what I call it. And so you're a lot more excited to talk about the products. It's like, oh, well, if, you, if you paid full price at Nordstrom, you're not going to brag about that too much, right? You just don't feel. Uh, right about really bragging. I totally paid full price for these. It was so expensive. But if you got a deal, you're way excited to tell somebody that you got the deal, and you're also very compelled to tell them where you got it. So the more unique the product, the better for us, because then people go, where did you get that's the cutest hat I've ever seen on a baby? Oh my gosh, I got it on this totally cool site, and it was 50% off. It's a site called Baby Steals, and they ship really fast, and stuff like that. So that's another way that we have been able to grow um, the way that we have. So the emotional connection that community leadership creates is often because of providing content and value that they're interested in. And you don't pay to look at somebody's art. You don't pay Justin Timberlake when you hear his song on the radio, but you just might go buy his single on iTunes if it impacted you. 
So I don't claim to say at all that our business is perfect, it is not, and nor is our community. There are lots and lots of ups and downs, especially with women online. <laughs> and um, the business itself, it's, it's, um, it's been amazing, and it's um, also had very, very tough times as well. Being an employer is not easy, and um, building community is uh, truly not a nine to five job. There have been um, many, many sleepless nights. Um, the typical work day is, um, well, the nice thing is I get to pick which four hours I sleep. <laughs> and um, so it's definitely um, sometimes a very thankless task, but um, it takes a lot of work, and um, it's, but it's raw, and it's organic, it's authentic, it's active, and it's ours, and it's all worth it. So building your own community, these would be my three tips. Add value, whatever it is, make sure you're providing something for someone else that will have passion around that. Be generous, and don't be afraid to fail. So I didn't imagine six years ago that I would be doing the things that I'm doing today, but I certainly wouldn't have dreamed that I could have started a business by connecting people from all over North America from a computer in my basement. So what is your community? Say what you believe and see who follows. All right, so we do have time for questions. We have about 10 minutes. Does anybody have any questions right there? So it's, it's a very unique idea. Are you seeing competition pop up? And if so, how are you staying relevant? Are you building a better community base? Great question. So the question is, um, are we seeing competition pop up? And, and what was the last part of it? Okay, how are we dealing that? Okay, great. So that's a good, an interesting point because babysteals.com um, and steals.com is, is, is the name of my company, but um, babysteals was actually the first daily deal site for women. And, and to be honest, it started almost eight months before Groupon. And so there's very vast differences between um, the way we do business and the other deal sites, if you will. I believe at this point we've hit the, um, We've hit the peak of how many, comp how many competitors we're going to have um, because there was a competitor that um, was up within three weeks of starting the company. It's not hard to create a website, right? Um, that competitor is now out of business because it is hard to build a business, but it is not hard to build a website. And um, there have been a huge amount of competitors that have started over the years. I should probably go through and tally up the number, but I would say out of the 15 that I can think of off the top of my head, there's really only two that still exist, um, aside from steals.com. But one of the reasons why I believe we're still here is, um, and, and that we've been able to grow and sustain, is, is really what you said, um, doing business so, so completely differently than most. People typically, um, not, not everyone, but People tend to start a website because it looks really easy, and it, you think you can cut corners in business, right? Hey, I'm going to start a website and sell stuff out of my basement. And it sounds easy, and it is not. And um, it, a lot of people cut corners. You can uh, be a drop shipper, if you will, meaning just simply be a middleman and sell products that you've actually never seen, that you order from someone else, and then you don't even actually have the inventory. You just sell it when... Um, somebody else buys it from you, or you buy it from them when somebody else buys it from you, and have them do the work. Um, typically, cutting corners, some people, I call that a cut, cutting a corner, right? Um, some people have made fortunes doing that, and most fail, because it um, really isn't very sustainable unless you have a really, really good, you know, back-end system and just completely amazing drop shippers, and it, um, we didn't want to do that because, um, we're very particular about our customer experience. I could never personally write back to a customer and blame a manufacturer or um, the post office or whoever for the fact that they don't have their order yet when we said that they would. Um, and most, a lot of websites really are, if you will, drop shippers, where, or I call it a middleman, and um, they, they can't help you because they're waiting for someone else to do the work. And I can't, I just, Rhett and I, when we started the business, we knew for sure that we didn't want to create a business off of someone else's promise and have to make excuses. If we did that, I'm positive we probably would not be here because um, the reason 
is because we've been able to fill, fulfill our promises. We don't sell anything we don't have in our inventory. So I guess to give you a quick background, the three things that really make our company different than most deal sites, one, we actually have the inventory and we're selling hard goods. So um, we're not selling like a voucher for a restaurant or another service like jazzercise or massage or whatever. Um, and then you go and you have an experience with someone else entirely. Um, that's one, we actually sell the physical goods and two, we have them before we sell them. We have it shipped to our warehouse and we, it, it's counted for quantity and it's checked for quality and then it goes through our photography department and then our copywriting and um, it goes through quite the process before we even sell it so that we can make sure that we're doing what we say we're going to do which is here's this beautiful product that we're, we're, we've highlighted for you today and that we can ship it quickly. And if we didn't do that, we wouldn't be able to um, fulfill those promises at all. So our brand would need to be much different if that was the case. And the other thing is we've treated our supplier, not just our customers, but our suppliers. We work directly with the manufacturers and we've paid every single bill on time. And we always do what we say we're going to do with those manufacturers as well. So we haven't burned any bridges in the industries that we serve. So for example, the juvenile industry, you know, and the baby world, all the companies that make baby products, they go to expos and trade shows and they talk to each other all the time. And I'm very fortunate to say that um, I don't know that there's any that wouldn't have anything but good things to say about us. So it's just doing what we say we're going to do. And so I think that's really, um, it's, it's definitely the tortoise and the hare, you know, um, method. It's, it's not the get rich quick method at all. And it's much more difficult but we didn't start the business under the premise of making huge amounts of money in a short period of time and cashing out either. It was based on a true need, so, um, and a passion and a, and a desire to connect these communities together. So uh, the only real way to do that is to provide value, as I mentioned, and do what you say you're gonna do. See right there, I saw that. Okay, so the question is, you have a content-based website and you're wondering how we've used social media to leverage, to create our community. Well, it's changed dramatically over the last um, seven years. At the time we started, Facebook didn't even have um, brand pages, like fan pages yet. But the day they started them, we created one. And it's, it's really, really changed. I, I, would ha I have different tactics nowadays than I, I would have had to take a dramatically different tactic now than we did back then, but at the time, when somebody, when we would post on Facebook and people who had liked our page, it would immediately go into their newsfeed if they logged into Facebook and it, everything was in chronological order. And now they have all those algorithms that they try to predict what you may or may not like and, um, and so it, it's not instant. And so, and they also kind of dissolved the actual posting on the brand's wall. And that's how we used to facilitate a lot of our connection was telling people to post on our Facebook wall questions and thoughts and for us. And that was mostly because at the time we didn't have the money to create a forum on our website or anything like that to, um, to give people the, the chance to interact. But um, I think to answer your question, how we did it, that was, that was really encouraging people and pointing to them directly where to go to have those conversations. And we did it a little bit differently for each website. So for scrapbook steals, for example, we would encourage people to create um, their layouts and share them with us in the photo albums on Facebook. So it really just kind of was different for every website. And I think um, the number one thing too is just being there. Um, for businesses that actually sell things or manufacture products, I think, um, I think it's, uh, at the time it was very unusual for them to really interact with people at all. Um, it became a lot more mainstream, but I think as far as content, it's expected, you know, for you to participate in that community. Um, but, you know, I don't know that I answered your question so good. <laughs> but it, yeah, it's just different. Um, but we can talk later, I'll figure out what it, you know, maybe I'll have a specific idea once I know more about what you, you do. Right there? Yeah, um, my question is, my first question is, where do you find your, your, your new products? <coughs> and second, if like a local guy like me had an idea, like, and I pitch it to you, would you help me out? Like, to <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the first question was, how do we find our products? Yeah. 
Okay, and the second one was if you. If I had like an idea about like baby, baby clothing or like uh -huh. scrapbooking, uh -huh. and I pitched to you and you're like, wow, that's pretty cool. You have uh -huh. to invest in that. Would you do that for like a local brand? Oh, yes, I do that all the time, sure. Yeah, I mean, as far as I could tell you whether I think it would sell or not and give you some tips on whether it would or not, I could go that far. I don't know, I'm, not, I'm no expert. Well, I actually kind of am, but <laughs> but I don't want I don't want you to think that you know it, what I say is going to be right. <laughs> but as far as um, how we get the products, we have um, a team of at least two buyers per website, so two people that uh, well almost that are are out looking for um, the latest and greatest products all the time, and that could be anything from um, industry trade shows. They go to almost every one of those to know what's what's coming up, what's next, what's next, what's next. Um, a lot of times now, to be honest, it kind of wraps into your question is, a lot of our buyers have become so ingrained with a lot of these manufacturers that they are calling us and saying, hey, help me, can, can I just give you the rundown of what my new line's gonna be and you can tell me what you think and how I should maybe adapt it. So it, it, that does happen quite a bit. Do they sell you their, their idea or their products if you can write it on your website? We can what? We, but we, d we partner directly with the manufacturer. So, you know, if it's a Jujube diaper bag, we will partner directly with that company to actually sell the products online, on, on our site. Did that answer your question? Okay, cool. Let's see, right here? That's a really good question. <laughs> That's a great question. Um, the story about how Rhett and I connected is um, kind of a, a business fairy tale in a way because um, the interesting thing was I wasn't looking for a business partner. It didn't even occur to me to have one. I um, was basically going to do it by myself and hire people as necessary. And one of the pieces of advice I got from someone, um, and remember this because it's excellent if you ever start your own business, um, if you choose to partner in business with anyone, make sure that you are partnering with someone who, who that has a skill that you cannot hire or fire. So, think about that. But meanwhile, um, uh, I, so to, to rewind, I was the director of KSL.com sales, and Rhett was um, in management at Backcountry.com, and our two of our employees were partnering together to create a cool promotion with um, KSL and the and Backcountry for the classifieds. And uh, Rhett and I met each other in one of the meetings. And I had this concept brewing. I was working on it every day. And I was probably six months in. And then um, ended up meeting Rhett. And I, th I th thought, whoa, this is one of the smartest, well, the smartest guy I had ever met in e-commerce, period. And, um, and in marketing, for that matter. And I'd met pretty much every big advertiser in Utah, um, and even in Provo, because I was um, in BYU sports sales for football and basketball for many years while I was at KSL as well. So um, I was blown away by his um, knowledge and skill in not just e-commerce, but in marketing. And we really, and I also just have this really crazy good gut feeling. And I'm a really good reader of people. And so um, I was really impressed by him. So then uh, I ran my, I, I ran the idea by him on a chance meeting about a year later, and I was about six months from launching, and he was really excited about the concept. He said, you know, I've never, I've never really heard of anything like that as it relates to marketing one product at a time. And then he told me about some sites that backcountry.com had that did sell. They were kind of like a daily deal, but in that they sold one product at a time, but it was like something new every 18 minutes, and it was kind of like, you'd probably heard of Steep and Cheap or Whiskey Militia. And so he was working on those sites, and we compared the differences between my idea and what they were doing, and they were vastly different, but he really um, was impressed by the difference and just the, the marketing concept and how it could move into the future. And so um, uh, we, we ended up having lunch three weeks before I launched the website um, on April Fool's Day of 2008. Um, the day before, he emailed me and said, hey, I don't know if you're still doing that Daily Deal website for women, but um, I just ran across a shopping cart technology that might be interesting. But the night before, I was working with my freelance web designer, and I, the last thing I said was, I will pick my shopping cart tomorrow night, I promise, because I had narrowed it down to two. And then I get this email from him, out of the blue, it had been six months since I had seen him, 
So I thought, okay, that's a little bit, we gotta go to lunch. I better take him up on the offer to, you know, um, give me some tips. So we went to lunch the very next day and had this amazing two and a half hour conversation and walked out full business partners. Gave him half the company, just like that. <laughs> no, I really did, and we launched the website. <laughs> we tease about that. Um, uh, we launched the website three weeks later, and the rest is history. We still are 50-50 owners, basically best buddies, and our families are friends, and you know, kumbaya. But um, I got, but I, I, when I say fairy tale, I really mean I got tremendously, tremendously lucky, um, you know, in finding Rhett, and then, um, and I'm just really lucky that um, he has skills that you can't hire and fire, right? I couldn't afford him if I tried to hire him right now, you know? He'd be way too expensive. So anyway, remember that if you ever start a business, make sure that you're not giving somebody a piece of the pie that you could just go out and hire a graphic designer or a marketer or those kinds of skills. Make sure there's somebody that really truly you see eye to eye with everything foundationally, especially how to treat people and um, money. So that's my little bit of advice. So I think we're out of time. Maybe I'll just take one last question. OK? Hello, my name is Manny. Hi, Manny. Well, tell me what transformational leadership means, <laughs> and then I can answer. <laughs> okay, well, absolutely then. So we, um, when Rhett and I hire new people, they go through um, quite the process of coming through the company. They start in, and um, they ship in the warehouse. They go through and, and meet with each individual department, especially customer service, for a specific period of time. And then they come through uh, about a week and a half later to a presentation that we created called We Send Joy, and it really gives them the mission behind the company, the purpose, the, the company overall, the mission behind each individual department in our company between customer service, shipping, and buying, and, um, and what our company means and how seriously we treat our customers. Is this what sets you apart from other companies? I don't really know if that sets us apart from other companies necessarily, because I really don't know what other companies do um, along those lines. I mean, I'm sure some. But um, as far as our leadership style, aside from making sure that everybody can buy into the vision um, and that everybody really understands what our company means on a day-to-day -day basis is that um, we really treat our employees the way we would like to be treated ourselves, as well as we demand respect um, mutually, mutual respect within the companies or within the employees. So you know, if anybody, we, we've actually had to you know, transform or transition a lot of people out of the business over time. Not a lot, but those that, um, that we believed weren't treating others with respect. And, um, and we, um, we kind of give people, what we say, enough rope to hang themselves with, because we don't like to micromanage, but we give them the overall goal of what it is we want them to do, and then we let them pick their own path. We just kind of give them the lane and let them go, and I think that makes people a lot more happy, too, because they feel like they're part of the end result. So anyway. Thank you, everybody.